This is Spencer with The MacGuffin, and today I'm joined by Graham Moore and Alan Leach from The Imitation Game, making sure I get that <laughs> right, uh, which is a biographical drama based on uh, the life and world surrounding Alan Turing during World War II and breaking of the Enigma Code. Um, let's start with... Um, a sort of broader sort of picture here um, for both of you. One of the things that was really interesting about this film and what really made me sort of think about was the recreation of true people in a sort of quote-unquote narrative fictional mm -hmm. film. Um, what is it like for you, Graham, trying to distill what was, I don't know, decades worth of material into two hours? And for you, Alan, what is it like trying to actually honestly capture somebody who is a living person. I don't know if you had any interaction with the family or any of that sort of stuff, but like not only is he a, a, a living, breathing person that you don't want to just like turn to a character, but he was a very complex person who had, um, you know, ended up being a double agent in the movie. Spoiler alert, man, you just gave it all up. No, no. <laughs> it's always very funny when you're doing a historical film because, you know, obviously so much of it can just be wikipedia so right. it's, it's hard to sort of talk about but um no i think i think the obviously there's a tremendous responsibility that we all felt telling a story like this i mean this is a story about real people and um and so you know alan turing's story is not as well known as we would like it to be and his is a story that i think has been kind of whitewashed out of a lot of historical now uh, narratives. Um, this film to us felt so much like a sort of secret history of World War II, a sort of secret um, queer history of computer science that, that hadn't been told before or hadn't been told to as broad an audience as we all felt it should be. Um, and so when you're approaching a history like that, you know, the responsibility is to get it right, tell it fairly, to tell it accurately. And then, of course, you know, Alan Turing lived for 41 years uh, before his life was so tragically cut short. And so there's this question of getting 41 years into a 113 minutes of, of screen time. And so obviously you can't get 41 years into 113 minutes. Um, so, you know, I think the goal for us always was, like, to try and um, – to try and explain the sort of big picture concepts. Um, so when we talk about like how how the Enigma code was broken, how Turing's team approached breaking the Enigma code, it was like what's what's the big idea that he did? What's the sort of big idea that he had to break the code? Uh, the machine, the sort of concept of crib-based decryption that they used. Um, how, let's let's sort of show that. Let's let's dramatize that and and you know give the audience the big picture of what he did um, because the, because the goal is to open up his mind to an audience. The uh, goal of the film is always to let an audience into Alan's mind and let them sort of experience the world the way he would have. And I think that this principle of with any given event, okay, how did Alan experience it? What did it feel like to Alan? Let's put that on screen was always the sort of animating principle and the sort of aesthetic guideline to use from every element of production, from the script to the production design to the score to the cinematography. It was, you know, let's shoot it how Alan would have felt it. Let's write it how Alan would have felt it. Let's design it how Alan would have felt it. Um, and I think that was a sort of helpful, basing it on his experience, the world was sort of a helpful guideline for everything. Um, but you obviously had to be a person. Uh, there's a great sense of responsibility when you play someone who actually existed, lived and breathed, was part of Bletchley Park, was there at the time, and obviously John Cairncross was, all of those things. So the best way to approach that is research. You try and do as much research as you can. And I was lucky enough that Cairncross had written his own book called The Enigma Spy, where he set out a huge amount of his beliefs in relation to the choices he made during the Second World War and after. And that allows you and informs you where to start really with a character. And then you try to get into their mindset and see exactly why they made the decisions they made. And as a performer then, you, you get to immerse yourself in that world and be that person and try to make those decisions as an actor at the time as well, within the scene, within rehearsals, and try and then flesh it out. Uh, with this one, we were very, very aware of the importance of Alan Turing's story within this. And that was the story we came to tell. All of the members of the Bletchley Park team deserve their own movies, I genuinely think. And I think it would be a fascinating series that we were trying to sell to HBO. <laughs> yeah, No, but uh, like I think you could genuinely do six movies, TV movies, of each character 
based around maybe the actual breaking of Enigma and and from each viewpoint. Uh, so each story works from view, one character's viewpoint. I think that would be fascinating. And I'll pitch that to Harvey Weinstein next time I see him. But uh, So we're, we're all very aware of the roles we played within this story and storytelling. So we were there to tell Alan Turing's story, which is such an important story to tell. One of the interesting things, and as you talk about Wikipedia and whatnot, um, what is it like in terms of shaping this, both from a script point of view and as an actor, in terms of deciphering, you know, fact versus fiction because there's so much stuff out there like even like i just got sucked down a rabbit hole looking into like the death of alan turing mm -hmm. and how many different theories there were in terms of, like was it suicide was it accidental was it uh murder and it, it was just like there's yeah. so many of these different things i imagine with john karen cross like I, I was reading about like his book and all the the skepticism about the authenticity of it and you know how it seemed to have some validation but still sort of like under uh, skeptical guys and a lot of this information what didn't come out until the 90s mm -hmm. about this whole thing so what was it like trying to capture like who these characters really were when there's still like all this you know somewhat of a mystery around this series or people and events and well, I think I'll, I'll first say that if, if the film has sent you to Wikipedia and if it's sent you to all the great books on the subject, then we've hopefully, then, then we've done our job. Like, that's the goal, right? Like, the film, then. good. Okay, then we feel very good about that. Like, I think, you know, a film, a piece of sort of narrative cinema, it can never be the last word on a subject. It's, it's hopefully the beginning of a conversation on a, on a subject. Like, this is, the film is us opening a conversation about Alan Turing and John Karen Cross and Joan Clark. And all these wonderful people. Um, so, you know, what we tried to do in terms of what we were going to depict historically, um, in, in terms of what we tried to depict as fact, was to to make the best educated guesses that we could. Obviously, especially when we were even talking about anything that happened at Bletchley Park. Um, you know, there's a scene at the end of the film when, when everyone takes sort of all the records from Bletchley Park at the end of the war, mm -hmm. throws them all in a big bonfire, burns them all. That's real. That happened. There was a big bonfire where they burnt every scrap of paper of their work at Bletchley Park. Mm -hmm. So, you know, everything that happened there, we're sort of doing our best to... And then, of course, the secret had been kept for 50 years. So we're kind of uh, and classified. So the goal was always to sort of get as many different sources for any particular thing that we could and try to sort of interpolate those sources. Um, you know, uh, I think when it came to Alan Turing's suicide, for instance, we felt we all felt very confident that um, uh, that sadly he did commit suicide. I, I would suggest that every major biographer of Alan Turing agrees with me that I it was mean, suicide. Like, I mean, it, it makes the most letter. Like, when you think about, like, one of the people who as his mom in, like, that time, like, it seems pretty logical that she wouldn't believe it. Yeah, and I think that's reasonable. I think with, with John Kieran Cross's character, it gets even trickier because this is someone who, um, deception is part of the game, so to speak. Yeah, it's the, it's the power of secrets and the knowledge and the power when you have the knowledge on someone else and, and, and keeping that secret together. And with Kieran Cross... I, I'm still amazed by the fact that this man who shared secrets with the Soviets believed that he was genuinely helping the war effort doing that and was in his absence awarded the highest honour by the uh, Soviet military because of information he gave in, in relation to one battle where they wiped out oh, I think five, five Nazi battalions. But they, he did that and it came out and he was never prosecuted and he was never tried or anything like that. Yet his compatriot, the man who gave us, was the forefather of the digital age and gave us the first computers, or the basis of the first computers, was tried for his sexuality, convicted of the act of gross and due being homosexual, was put on a course of medication that ultimately saw him take his own life. There's a great injustice there, but then with Karen Cross, how much then did MI6, what was the true involvement? Was he, was he in there and were they watching him? Or was he actually there with the MI6? Was he always, was he a part of them? Or what did Karen Cross know that the MI6 didn't want to come out? Well, and, that, and that's one of the interesting things that sort of occurs to me as you guys are talking about this, is that, you know, um, okay, so these documents are released, not to sound like a conspiracy theorist or anything, but it's like they've kept how the secret the for is? so long. It's like how, how much faith can you put in these documents to believe that they are 100% accurately portraying the story, especially since probably a lot of them were written so long ago. It's like, it's just like, I, it's, it's such an interesting film that it makes you wonder like, what is real? What is fiction? And, and, and I mean, I'm sure 
at the core of the story, it's a lot of it's accurate, but it's like, um, for instance, um, one of the interesting points with the John Karen Cross, he's a really interesting, empathetic character in a lot of ways, but the connection with him and Alan, Alan Turing in terms of like, you know, hiding the secret, sharing the circuit, A, he seems completely unfazed by the whole thing, which is quite remarkable to me in terms of the time period, but um, how, how would you find something out? Like, how much of that could, was dramatized for the purposes of the movie versus, like, actually knowing what was, like, going through his head? Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, we don't know. It's not like we have records of every conversation they had. It's not sure. like we have records of, you know, every conversation Alan had with Joan. Um, but we do have some stuff. We have letters that Alan Turing sent. We have his descriptions, uh, letters to some friends and some family members about the war. We have recollections given by people... Um, written down by people sort of in the last 15, 20 years who had been there, um, so giving us their accounts of, of what happened. Um, so, for example, um, with what you were just mentioning, um, uh, you know, we know we know that Alan was open about his sexuality to close friends and to close co-workers at Bletchley. We have a couple people who were there who said, you know, and I think this is quite remarkable about Alan, he was not... Um, Alan Turing felt no personal shame about his sexuality. He felt no personal embarrassment about it. Um, he had such a logical mind. It was sort of like, well, but why does it matter, right? Like his, For him, we, it was taste. Yeah, it was any other taste. You like chocolate, I like vanilla. You know, you like girls, I like boys. It's not, it's any other taste or preference. Why is one sort of more morally valid than another? It seemed ridiculous. Correctly so. Yeah, but I love that the only thing that he ever found illogical in this was people's reaction to the fact yeah. that he, he liked men. You know, I I, I think that's it. Just shows what it, what what an open mind he had and what an amazing mind he had. Yeah, and so then we know, you know, we know from some accounts of people who worked closely with him at Bletchley that he did tell some mm. of the people he worked with closely, and that they were quite accepting of it. Um, mm. That they were sort of like, oh. Yeah, we sort of figured. Um, and so that was a scene that was based on some of those interactions that we do have accounts of. But even the account of Joan, when, when he said, yeah. he turned and said, when they were engaged and said, look, I, I'm gay. And she went, I, I don't care. <laughs> Fine. We were never going to have a normal relationship. But so, so what? Like genuinely. Yeah. And that's true. You know, she talked about that. Yeah. We have interviews with Joan Clark from the 1990s where she talked about that conversation and that being the case. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, people were, it's interesting. I think I think people were sort of, personally and individually accepting of Alan Turing's homosexuality, mm -hmm. even though societally and institutionally, there was obviously this tremendous kind of institutional persecution happening mm -hmm. of gay men. But the people who he was actually closest to were, yeah, quite accepting about it. And Hugh Alexander actually turned up and, and uh, testified at his trial. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one of the most interesting ones to me was the cop who sort of invis investigated in the first place. And he's like, wait, what? Like, this is what we're doing? Wait, this isn't what I thought was going on at all. Yeah. It was just yeah. like a fascinating turn of... Uh... No, and he's that was a really interesting character. I wanted that character... Uh, you know, I'll say that that is the only... That is the only fake name used in the film. That is not the name of the actual police officer um, who uh, investigated Turing. Um, the real police officer did not uh, pass away terribly long ago, and I didn't feel it was sort of appropriate to. He's a family, and it just yeah. So what name did you give them? I gave him Robert Knock, who is my old roommate, um, who is very thrilled that he is the man who ends up killing Star. Alan Turing. My yeah. old roommate Robbie is thrilled. Um, but that is obviously based on a real character, and that investigation did really happen. You know, what I was interested in was how. How someone who is a good man, who is not not a homophobe, not a bad person, is who is just doing his job becomes part of the sort of institutional persecution of Alan Turing and the sort of institutional discrimination against gay men. Seeing how someone who, you know, a, a good person, a smart person, a capable person is at the same time swept up in this thing and he ends up being the very reason for Alan's downfall, even though that's not what he wanted at all. I mean, this is a, a pretty amazing part of history. Um... And it was, it was interesting, I was talking with people beforehand, it just, it really rings home in a lot of ways just how much, like, I don't know if it's an educational thing or just a general ignorance thing, but it just, it's one example of how much stuff is out there that a lot of people don't know. Um, how did you guys first become aware of this story? Were you really knowledgeable about Alan Turing prior to this. Like, I mean, I was familiar with ter terms like the Turing machine and mm. stuff like that, but I can't say that I was so well versed in the history too. I was, I was very like you. I knew certain words. I knew the name Alan Turing. I knew the name of code. I, 
Uh, bar that, I, I didn't really know much more on him. And it wasn't until I read Graham Moore's script. Uh, I don't know why I gave you your whole name there, but it, <laughs> um, until I read Graham's script and that I, uh, that I, I, I was absolutely blown away by this man's life. And I genuinely was like, truth was stranger than fiction. What, what this man lived through was in, incredible. The mind he had and what he achieved was absolutely mind mind blowing to me mm-hmm. and and the fact that he was so so poorly treated by the british authorities it really infuriated me and i also felt ashamed that i didn't know more about this man and that's why i was so i was i was that's how i got kind of and hooked and you do like you who say yourself you you read this script or you see this movie and you want to know more about this man because you realize how important he is to our everyday life he influenced all of our lives let alone the amount of lives he saved with the work he did the fact that the machines we use to communicate every day, they wouldn't exist without this man's first ideas. That's mind blowing. Yeah. Why why is he a, why yeah. why isn't he as well known as Steve Jobs, you know, Bill Gates? Because they wouldn't have had jobs if it wasn't for him. Yeah. That's one of my favourite quotes I just came up with. <laughs> that was good. That was you yeah. rhyme with everything that was yeah. that was tremendous. Um no, I mean for for my part, I was I feel lucky enough to have known Alan Turing story since I was a teenager. Um I was sort of uh, a techie kid, and so I think among the sort of tech community, his 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 role is better known. Although I think one interesting thing is, you know, since we finished the film, we've sort of we started to do some screenings for um, computer science folks and mathematicians. And um, one of the one of the moments that I've really loved since finishing the film is having um, computer scientists sort of come up to me after the film and say, "Oh, you know, I we studied Alan Turing in university. I wrote a paper on him at." at college, um, but I didn't know, I had no idea that he was gay. I had no idea that he broke the Enigma code. I mean, some of them don't even know the sort of code-breaking part of his life. Like, there's, sometimes people know kind of little bits about him, but not the whole story. And I think this was, that was so much of the, our goal with the film was sort of to bring, to bring his personal story to the forefront of computer science, of the Second World War. And also not just his story, but to, to celebrate his life. Yeah. And I genuinely feel that what's wonderful about this movie is, while it's a very sad and tragic end, it is a tribute to being different, and it's a tribute and a celebration of Alan Turing. Perfect. Graham, Alan, thank you so much for thank joining you me. Thank you. Thank you. The best of luck with thank the Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm on fire tonight. Magneto can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Even Zod can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. This type don't even try to bite the sun. Mr. Spock can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Wrath of Khan can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. The Borg can't stop me. I'm on fire tonight. Because I've got space game and it feels all right.